You're listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content. We think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite. Like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. Philosophers call someone a relative, by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. My simple response to that is this. No one holds that view. No one believes that every view is as good as every other view. Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today I am here with Adnan Hussein, a history professor at Queen's University and the co-host of the Guerrilla History Podcast with Brett O'Shea, who some of you might know from uh, Revolutionary Left Radio. I'm a big fan of both of these podcasts. They're very excellent. If you want to get a good knowledge on the history of various leftist movements and history in general. I actually uh, first decided to bring you on, and I really wanted you were high on my guest list because not that many people who are on the left side of the political spectrum read Ibn Khaldun. We'd probably both agree that Ibn Khaldun is just not read enough in the Western uh, hemisphere in general. For my listeners, I think Ibn Khaldun is probably the most underrated thinker that you've probably never heard of, or if you've heard of him, you haven't read, because why would this apply to our time? Why would we need to read this? So that's the first question I will ask, uh, Adnan, is why should we care about Ibn Khaldun? Why, should, why is he important? Well, uh, first, thank you so much for inviting me on, Tony. This is a real pleasure, and I'm very excited for this conversation. And um, uh, I agree. I think uh, the Barn Vlog is just a very fascinating, <clears throat> long-form conversation, and I enjoyed that conversation. So uh, I'm getting good vibes that this is going to be a real interesting intellectual exploration together. Um, but I agree with you that I think Ibn Khaldun is one of the most important thinkers that nobody ever really talks about. Um, and uh, the reason why I think he's uh, very significant or very important is because he's really uh, the, a pioneer in a form of social scientific style thinking about really treating uh, human society, its social organization, um, as uh, itself an object of study. And he comes to this through really trying to explain and understand history and to put the study of history on the footing of a science or in Arabic, an ilm, that is a kind of philosophical discipline of knowledge that is about general kind of laws or norms rather than as history is so often thought of then and now uh, as just about specific particular cases and their preservation and narration in an organized and coherent way. And what he wanted to do was turn <clears throat> the study of history into something that could help explain how change happens, why it happens in the way that it does, and whether there were patterns or norms to human social life and social organization. And so he cast the net really pretty widely in terms of embracing things that we would think today as inhabiting very separate and substantial disciplines of politics and political science on the one hand, to economics and economic activity, to most fundamentally how human society is organized and what we would think of as sociology. So the people who have actually read him think of him as somebody who pioneered social scientific study. Um, one area that you could also say that he seems to make big contributions to our anthropology as well. 
And especially when you think about the Middle East tribal structures that were so important in early ethnographic analysis of, you know, Bedouin, Turkic, uh, Berber, as they were called, you know, back in, in colonial times, uh, 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 those social organizations that depend on this idea of a fictive, whether it's fictive or not, but the idea of descent from a common ancestor as the basis for the social organization of a society. So he was very interested in trying to understand, I think, not only how to understand what's true and what's false in history by generating a historicist and materialist analysis of social conditions that allows you to tell whether some of these more fabulous stories that get retailed and retold uh, and preserved in historical books um, you know, whether they make sense or not and being able to critique them uh, on the basis of understanding how society works. And that was the real uh, contribution that he made is to try and develop this social scientific understanding as a science, as laws of human social organization in order to understand history. So I think that's actually a profound kind of form of uh, materialist and historicist analysis uh, that really only until, you know, maybe you could say the 19th century, late 18th and into the 19th century, that thinkers in other parts of the world working in other but allied sorts of traditions came to kinds of insights that he was developing from the vantage point of a 14th century polymath administrator, uh, politician and administrator himself, and and also religious scholar and and scholar of, of of history in the 14th century North Africa. So, you know, it's very um, exciting in some ways when you come across his work and see how many deep insights he has about social phenomena, human culture and society and politics um, that, uh, you know, we think of as products just of the 19th century revolutions in 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 social thought of like Marx, Durkheim, Weber, uh, you know, and uh, Georg Zimmel and others. And here's somebody who several hundred years ago, maybe in a slightly different language, is contributing similar kinds of insights. Uh, it's more of an Aristotelian kind of language. Um, and that's, in fact, actually, I think, his big, uh, he has a kind of methodological statement where he says, uh, you know, history can be, there is a science here even though it's been dismissed by Aristotle. And what he was trying to do in a way is sort of respond to the philosophical tradition and forms of knowledge and uh, invent, as it were, a form of, of uh, philosophy, as it were, that is a form of science um, that could contribute something to an understanding of how human beings and their, and their social world develops and changes. Right. That's absolutely such a fact that when you come across his work, it's quite amazing how interdisciplinary it is. It covers just about everything in the social sciences, even stuff out, to a certain extent outside of the social sciences and the, and the hard mm -hmm. sciences, but really more the social sciences. And he's been compared to all, a lot of figures, Machiavelli, due to having a political career and having a, a, a certain sense of realism uh, that he incorporates into his theory as well as his own experience. But I think really, as you mentioned, Weber, Marx, Durkheim, these are like those big holistic thinkers who try to understand history and society in a scientific way that I think he's probably most comparable to in terms of his methodology. And I guess uh, maybe a, the Marxist language to describe him would be that of a historical materialist in a certain sense, right? As, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. As a... Um, only some people have seemed to write about, at least in English, as, as far as I've seen, and uh, what's translated in the English literature. But uh, Ibn Khaldun, of course, is writing in a certain uh, context that was already quite advanced for his time, right? And he's writing at the decline of the uh, Islamic Golden Age, sort of the, the 1300s, dies in 1406, I believe. And uh, he during the time there you have a very vibrant time period in history where the islamic world 
is far ahead of medieval Europe, but he he when he's born already the Mongol invasion of Baghdad has happened. There's a decline that's set in, and he's this affects his views, right? And one of the things he's most famous for, if you Google Ibn Khaldun, you'll find all sort of things. Some things I think uh, aren't so good at all. Honestly, I, I wouldn't take mo most of the stuff on YouTube. If you want a good book. Probably Yves Lacoste's book, Ibn Khaldun, that was published with uh, Verso, is pretty good. Uh, but he's famous for the rise and decline of civilizations. And people love to talk about this. And uh, I would love to get into this, exactly what his theory is. But maybe, first and foremost, would you like to elaborate the historical context in which he's writing in, uh, just to avoid, of course, the trap of presentism, in which people might try to project present understandings onto him? Uh, because of course he's his book his book was his work was found i believe by french archaeologists in in a, when they colonized north africa correct and they yeah it didn't exist in a huge number of manuscripts and um even though he was famous to some extent within his time so we can't say that uh he was an unknown obscure figure outside of like uh the main uh you know, salons of, 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 of intellectual engagement or power. I mean, he did serve sovereigns. He was a major administrator. He ended up working also in Egypt, which was in no way any kind of backwater when you're talking about the medieval Islamic world as one of the centers of the, the whole culture and civilization. And he even came to the notice and attention of that world conquering Turco-Mongol Lord Tamerlane, as he's known in English, Timur Lang, um, and they had a, a kind of famous uh, uh, meeting um, because, uh, well, I think Ibn Khaldun was uh, curious about, uh, you know, this, this great uh, conqueror. And um, I believe Timur had heard that this is, uh, that Ibn Khaldun was somebody who understood the secrets of power and, um, you know, uh, dynastic uh, uh, creation in history. And so that is indeed what he is known for his theory of dynastic cyclicism. But I think you were very right, Tony, to mention that um, this is a period where, uh, you know, political legitimacy is suffering a kind of crisis. There's been a fragmentation in, that had started, you know, several centuries before, uh, you know, since really the Abbasid Empire um, became kind of localized. Um, and so you have different local or regional dynasties under, you know, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Muslim world who are ruling in, in their particular areas in North Africa, the Maghreb, as was called the place of the West the setting of the sun was, you know, in some ways uh, following its own kind of political and, and social and cultural trajectory outside of what we might think of as the central Islamic lands that you were referring to, you know, in Baghdad, where the seat of the caliphate was. And as I just mentioned, Cairo and Egypt being, you know, kind of the other end uh, of that central Islamic uh, territory, um, that it had been fragmented and that the, the Mongol conquests were uh, devastating uh, from a symbolic sense of legitimacy. And I think a historian and somebody who was interested in dynastic um, trajectories and, you know, how you could understand the rise and fall of different uh, kind of major historical and political political movements in history, Ibn Khaldun was you know trying to think about well, what do you make of what do you do with the situation that the caliphate, um, uh, the Abbasid caliphate had ended. Before that, there had been a period where there were three caliphs, you know, claiming legitimacy. You know, one in uh, the Umayyad uh, uh, caliphs of Cordoba in southern Spain. Um, the Fatimid caliphs, uh, who had their capital um, in Cairo and had just begun um, as a movement uh, in um, Tun what is modern day Tunisia with their capital city of, in Mahdiya before they conquered Cairo. And this is the territory that Ibn Khaldun himself uh, lived and worked in. So he was very conscious of the legacy of these Fatimid caliphs as well. And so he was trying to make sense of. Um, you know, both the longevity of some of these dynastic houses, but also the actual reality of current fragmentation and trying to think about 
what had happened in North Africa, which was that there was this ceaseless turnover of local smaller dynasties that would come, um, you know, from the hinterlands, establish themselves for several generations, but then be promptly replaced by some other Berber or, you know, Bedouin kind of power. And so he had to kind of invent a new sort of theory about how and why this happens. And so I think that's kind of the situation and the conditions in which he was, he was operating and the kinds of problems that he felt he needed to address his own study of history most fundamentally to. Right. And one of the things that he's most famous for is considering the biggest factor, or at least one of the biggest factors for the decline of civilizations is what he calls asabia, which often gets translated into group feeling or group mm -hmm. solidarity, usually in, in the English language. But of course, it's, it's much more than that. It's really what he considers to be the bedrock of political power. And, exactly. And uh, for, I think Asabia would be really crucial to break down when it comes to the rise and decline of civilizations and its relation to, I think, what most mainstream explanations neglect is class and wealth differences. I think that's a lot of people overlook that when it comes to, especially chapter three, when he talks about the imposition of royal authority or the imposition mm -hmm. of what we would probably call today states uh, and, um, and, and its role in this decline of social solidarity. But first, what is Asabia? And is it as some, I've noticed some people on the right have been keen to co-opt as is it is it some sort of racial essentialism? Is it some kind of uh, uh because... it is definitely <laughs> it is yeah, that so just the uh, yeah, it, it, off, yeah. It, it is definitely not some general theory of uh, you know, the decline of racial integrity through mixing, and that this is you know, it's not a racialist theory. Um, it is a social theory, however, uh, so there, he doesn't essentialize uh, race um, at all, I think, you know, in, in his thought. Fundamentally, Asabia, as you were saying, Tony, is, uh, um, you know, this kind of bond. It's a social bond. Basically, what he's interested in is what's the social relationship that ties people together that allows them to accept disciplined command and direction to achieve a common goal and make sacrifices to do so. And what's interesting is he roots the fundamental basis of political power in what we might think of as uh, sentiments. You know, uh, it's this feeling of connection. And so he introduces what I would say is a very anthropological and very cultural component and emotional, you might component, you might say a social economy of uh, lineal descent of, um, you know, household dynamics of, um, affect and how it is. And this is something that, you know, this is, you know, even the Greeks, you know, thought that Eros, you know, uh, these bonds of, of love, of sentiment were, you know, crucial to understand in order to make sense of why people give up, you know, what might be narrow temporary individual interests for, you know, others. And that's the basis for society is that people are willing to do that. So he is trying to understand, understand this. And what he argues, and is also very ecological and, as you say, class oriented and related, uh, that the bonds of Asabia, uh, the strength of Asabia, which is the key motive and force politically in, in history, is can be strengthened and it can be weakened. And what strengthens it are things like harsh conditions where survival is very difficult and you need to cooperate with a group of people in order to survive. So he bases his whole theory from this kind of position that Aristotle has, uh, that insight that, you know, human, humans are a, a, you know, political animal. What I think Ibn Khaldun argues is human beings are a social animal and that politics flows from that's so the, the, the way in which this social, these social relationships express themselves in, in collective action, which produces power and thus politics. And he says there's something more fundamental than just the idea 
that we are political, we're social. And that, you know, because human beings always have had to cooperate with one another, this produces the sentiments of connection and of loyalty um, in the family, in the clan, in the tribe. And um, in harsh conditions, this is even stronger because the, you don't have a division of labor in society, essentially, is I think his theory. And he does have a theory of the, the division of labor in society that is very important. And but the labor in, theory of value. Indeed. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we can probably get into that. But I mean, in the kind of uh, countryside, in the kind of mountains, in these kind of marginal areas uh, where life, is, life conditions are very harsh, he thinks Asabia becomes strengthened by the necessary interdependence and cooperation of people. And that this expresses itself in a variety of ways. One is the tribal form. But another, and the reason why this, and, and so he will talk about, you know, ways in which this can be weakened by people not seeing and mixing with other groups where the tribal characteristics of how their asabia had been developed can then be, you know, diluted or weakened in various ways. But it's not a racial theory and it's not a like kind of blood descent kind of uh, poly. It's not based just on blood descent because he also points out that almost as strong as a family connection is, are lines of patronage. And you have this institution in Muslim, medieval Muslim societies where people take on, you know, for mutual benefit, uh, you know, uh, uh, a patron, you know, pe uh, people become clients to patrons and um, tie their interests to whether it's a religious scholar as a student, whether it is a Sufi you know, master and a disciple, whether it is a military commander and one of their kind of close bodyguard and men at, men at arms, that there is an affiliative relationship that is purely one of social creation, um, where one person is, you know, in a position where they have either power or wealth or, um, you know, knowledge uh, that they can benefit others with. And it creates forms of interdependence where others attach themselves for the purpose of apprenticing and training. And this creates bonds of connection that he thinks are almost as strong as family ones. So the point here is, is that what he's doing is he's really looking at the conditions and at the relational situation of power in social bonds and social relations in order to develop this theory about what Asabia is, this sense of group commitment that will allow people to work together, to sacrifice together. And he argues this is what proves to be uh, decisive, like on the battlefield. He has a whole chapter where he talks about military affairs. And he says, you know, it's not about numbers. You know, numbers are, you know, not completely irrelevant. But, you know, the larger army doesn't always defeat the smaller, you know, force. And that is because there may be tactical consideration and all that. But quite apart from that, he believes that strong asabia makes a disciplined fighting force that will be organized together, will sacrifice together, and thus will overcome large numbers where people don't see their interests connected to one another. And, you know, if they're in danger, they will flee. Whereas those who are, you know, part of a strong group uh, that has strong asabia, then they will be successful because that is where power flows from. So it's a profoundly material social analysis of power. Right. And when Marxists sometimes, Marxists of the more vulgar variety, hear things like consciousness being a uh, huge factor in history, they tend to think, oh, that's idealism. And be very skeptical about ideas or, or more, more broadly consciousness, something that isn't exactly materially observable, having such an effect. But as you pointed out, Ibn Khaldun's analysis of Asabiya, this group solidarity, is very much a material reality. It's, and it's constituted by material conditions, and it in effect shapes material conditions. So it's, it's very interesting insofar as it incorporates an element of a agency, a sort of collective will, I, I mentioned in an essay I wrote on Ibn Khaldun, a sort of collective will to power almost, because the context in which he talks about Asabiya is, and unlike Nietzsche, however, it would be, it's a will to power constituted by material conditions, not something 
abstracted yeah, from them. Not, not some like just philosophical right. or moral, not in a moral, he wouldn't use that, but just like some strength of will. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But it, I, it is inseparable from power because he, when he talks about uh, group feelings, he talks about how all groups have group feeling. But in a context, there are many different group feelings that emerge. But the context of Asabiya particularly is the group feeling in which people are willing to, as you mentioned, make those sacrifices and follow a sort of leadership in a process of overcoming uh, tribal battles and essentially conquering other, other groups, other tribes, and being able to keep those other groups under its umbrella under the dominant group's umbrella. It's more than just um, the, the ra race, right? And uh, there's a lot of quotes to debunk the idea that it, it is necessarily related to racial pedigree. Of course, it's, it's related, but it's not essential. So racial essentialists will think the fact of homogenization or racial homogeneity makes a group more stronger and have more solidarity, whereas he points out uh, the consequences of common descent, though natural, are still something imaginary, right? Yes. It's, an imag it's an imagined community, right? And, and, that's uh, right. And, uh, and that's he, exactly why you can have, I mean, you know, these uh, uh, patron-client relationships be just as important, almost as important, um, very significant, and they're purely affiliative. You know, they they are produced by uh, you know, somebody possessing some resource, you know, as I said, whether it's knowledge or military power and skill or, and, you know, uh, other individuals, you know, attach themselves, give their loyalty, um, in order to, uh, contribute and receive benefits. And, and they also make sacrifices and contribute. And this bond can become an extremely close one. It can last for you know, one's whole life uh, and even um, uh, beyond. I mean, you have people who, you know, believe in the patronage of their, you know, uh, their, 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 uh, you know, former, former um, supporters and so on as still providing some cultural cachet, some kind of like uh, social and cultural capital that's of benefit to them. And that is, as you were saying, much like the tribal relationship where it's the imagined descent from a common ancestor. It's the story, and this is what history is about, is telling the story that accomplishes what's necessary socially in that moment is that it creates the context for an imagined community um, that tells the story that we are all descendants of, you know, uh, uh, Hisham, you know, or some other, you know, tribal chief. and that's a political statement. It means, okay, that means we have ob mutual obligations to one another for defense and support and, and mutual aid and all of those things. It's a political story that we tell about ourselves. And um, it's not some essentialized, and for Ibn Khaldun, and of course, much like for modern social scientists, it's not something that's, you know, uh, essential. It's something that's produced and created in the culture and has real material consequences um, and so is subject to that and can't be essentialized into race or into true descent. Um, the, you know, there are a lot of passages where Ibn Khaldun does critique and maybe we need to come to that. The reason why a lot of these right-wing figures that you're in some ways introducing me to because I have not come across them because I haven't looked on these sorts of uh, you know, kind of popular discussions uh, of Ibn Khaldun, but in reading the text myself, I've often thought, oh, wow, you know, some kind of racial supremacist or somebody who's an anti-immigrant, you know, bigot, <laughs> you know, might say, well, look, there's, Ibn Khaldun is talking about how uh, kind of mixing of, of dissent weakens Asabiya. Um, but what he's talking about is fundamentally, when he's talking about basically is Madani, is municipal or uh, a civil, you know, society that is society in cities where the whole sociological conditions are totally different from the tribal or rural countryside or the mountain, you know, high plateaus and so on, 
uh, where the harsh existence requires a certain kind of direct and obvious interdependence and cooperation. In the, in the city, his theory of the division of labor, um, which you know is very similar in some ways to other people who have had this insight from Adam Smith on to like, you know, Emile Durkheim, is that in larger scale societies of a city, people specialize and they essentially trade their skills and labor for the necessities that they need and that nobody can produce all of their necessities for themselves under those kinds of conditions. And so society organizes itself around this division of labor, which can be more equitable, it can be more hierarchical, it can have all kinds of problems. But the division means that you have people who are fundamentally connected with people that they have no obvious you know, story to tell about their descent. And as a result, that's what he kinds of, he, he means by the kind of asabia of the uh, military powerful tribal groups that come from harsh uh, country you know, areas begins to wane and weaken as people manufacture different forms of interrelationship that are not as obviously uh, uh, you know, and deeply rooted in the sentiments produced by mere survival. And that's all he's saying. He's not, you know, I don't think he's saying that, you know, diverse groups of people uh, can't, uh, you know, have asabia and that the, you know, society decays. He just thinks it's a natural kind of problem that you then need different forms of asabia than the ones that may have developed political power through military conquest in this environment of North Africa. And as a result, this is why he thinks religion is very important. He thinks that there are forms of affiliation and a kind of group identity narrative that can be created um, uh, when you get the cosmos, you know, reordered, like when it's bigger than yourself and, you know, you have a prophet, somebody who brings a new religious dispensation or message that galvanizes people to reform or to change or to band together. And if that is combined with uh, other forms of asabia that do develop from, you know, kind of these other tribal affiliations and conditions, and you put the two together, you have a very powerful uh, dynastic uh, dispensation that is capable of being produced that will last much longer than the normal tribal every four generations, you know, uh, you have a conqueror, then you have the apogee of culture and civilization after the conquest, because they still have strong asabia, but now they have all the wealth of the city. And so they, you know, have an efflorescence of culture, but then the next generation, the third generation is now brought up only in the city environment, in the court, in the, you know, in the uh, kind of urban civilization and they've left the sort of memory of the harsh conditions that produced and they start developing different kinds of interests and are much more a play to the factions that are organized in a much more complex and stratified social scape of the urban, you know, division of social labor. And as a result, then the generation after that is weak and ready for the, you know, kind of conquest of some hungry outsiders who do have strong asabia, right? So that's the kind of cycle, the dynastic cycle that he's talking about. Um, but he thinks there are longer trajectories of dynastic or civilizational, you know, uh, endurance that are when you combine multiple levels of uh, group feeling like a big religious uh, ideology that may last like several hundred years. And that's how he tries to explain the emergence of this great civilization and culture of the, you know, kind of Umayyad and then Abbasid caliphates that, you know, were the largest land empires of their time and maybe in history up until the Mongol conquests of the 13th century, uh, but that those then uh, failed, uh, you know, to be able to um, defeat uh, the Mongols and you have a different kind of situation that he's trying to explain. Um, so the point here, I guess, a long way of saying is that he's looking at kind of concrete, both material and cultural conditions that produce this kind of uh, form of social solidarity and feeling uh, that can have lasting political legitimacy and power, um, um, you know, over a period of history.
Yeah, and, and we'll get into just the that material effect that can lead to the decline of asabiya that people often overlook. They think of it merely as a, well, if they don't read it at all, they'll think it's merely due to mixing. But if people do read it, they'll see it's due to leisure and, and luxury and decline and complacency. But then they miss the class conflict dynamic there, which which we'll get into a bit after, because I do want to just, just address the race question again, because I'll give an example of a, a, a book read written about Ibn Khaldun, such as uh, by Ed West. It's called Asabiya, what uh, Ibn Khaldun can teach us about the world today. And more or less, his argument is like Samuel Huntington oh, type dear. of argument, which is that <laughs> we democracy can't really work because there's too many immigrants and we're not, we don't have a sense of social solidarity. And it's, uh, what, what it misses, of course, is, well, one, for, so Ibn Khaldun, this is a. Wait, I just have to. I have to stop you there just to ask you a question. Did this mm. person write this work uh, only dealing with uh, the, you know, who we are book, but forgot the Clash of Civilizations uh, book of of Huntington and feels comfortable using a Muslim medieval Muslim, you know, philosopher to justify, you know. Uh, a problem about the decline of the West that needs to be dealt with. That seems to be very sort of strange. Uh, yeah, they, they, the author struck me more as a conservative liberal type. And, uh, but the point is, you'll get this sort of interpretation even with um, people who, might, who, are, who are Arabic themselves. For mm -hmm. example, uh, and, and you tend to see in politics, aside from Ibn Khaldun, this sort of assumption that you can revive community by appealing to religion to uh, racial pedigrees and this is such a thing uh in lebanon i'm half lebanese and a lot of Le lebanon is super diverse and there's this obsession with different uh people shia sunni and christians who like to debate as to their lineage some say no you're actually persian you're not really lebanese and you're, you're of a different descent we're not the same and this sort of uh let me guess, of... they say that about the, uh, the Shia. Yes. Yeah, they say they're Persians. <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> it means yeah. they don't understand anything about history because southern Lebanon was Shia before Iran was. Iran didn't become a majority Shia land until, you know, Shah Ismail in the 16th century. You know, whereas there were, you know, Shia scholars. Um, in fact, actually, when they wanted to, when Shah Ismail, this is according to some of these historical reports, uh, you know, chronicles from, you know, the early modern period, that when Shah Ismail uh, was looking for uh, some kind of religious ideology, basically, uh, to root his conquest of Iran under, um, he decided, let's go for the imami or Twelver Shiism. He had been part, he was kind of a more radical figure who was saying, I am the Messiah. I am like a theophany of God. You know, I mean, he was making big claims. Uh, well, after he was defeated by the Ottomans, he decided, well, we better consolidate, you know, Persia, which is where he had already conquered and was ruling. So we need a kind of like stable and a religious ideology and legal structure and system. And so he looked for, Let's use Twelver Shiism. And, uh, but nobody knew much about uh, Shiism in Iran. So he went and he got like, you know, scholars from southern Lebanon, um, you know, to, to help make Iran Shia. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a totally yeah. ridiculous uh, ahistorical idea. And uh, Ibn Haldun, actually, he really does go and attack people who tend to make assumptions based on on race, uh, although one can make criticisms of his own ideas, because yeah, yeah, he just wrote a lot of. So there's people can pick apart quotes, but uh, there's this interesting part in which people are. He addresses the question about um, why black people are black in Africa, and he, <laughs> there's some people who give all kind of mystical explanations, and he says, no, it's because of the sun. He's right. He's, well, very he's, he's working on that kind of like older geographical, uh, F, uh, you know, knowledge that where there were those traditions that you're darker when you were closer to the equator, which, you know, like actually, you know, that has something to it in the sense that, you know, skin color doesn't mean very much other than, you know, what was developed in order to, you know, 
shield from the from the sun and still be able to make enough vitamin D, you know, basically. So, but he's working on that on that kind of that's a pre-existing tradition of geographical knowledge, um, you know, where this is an explanation about the Earth being divided into different climes, like zones, uh, you know, temperate and more extreme, and so on. And they made a kind of racial theory based on this environmental kind of knowledge and, un, and, and understanding. I mean, in some ways, totally zany, but let's of his time. It's not like he invented or made up some kind of new sort of explanation to try right. and well, rationalize it. I mean, like even that is much more advanced than the curse of ham thesis, which is, which was what people believed, like a lot of people believed in. <laughs> He uh, and would go on to believe after to right in Europe for like many years, many centuries. And um, he, he has this great part where he says the fact of common descent only evokes a sabia if it's obvious and clear. And if because it's um, it's imaginary and devoid of reality. This is already quote. And. If, if it becomes only a matter of scientific knowledge, one's racial pedigrees, that is. It is useless because it can no longer move the imagination and is denied the affection caused by group feeling. And his point w within that is that it's the social relations, not, exactly. not that you can appeal to these racial pedigrees. And one might read that and say, okay, sure. But what if we use religion to strengthen Asabia? And he does say that religion functions as a glue that can strengthen Asabia, but he also makes this crucial distinction between them when saying that religion cannot metastasize, religion cannot materialize without asabiya. So asabiya right. is like the primary thing. Yes. And so religion just becomes a ritual that people will follow and it will get people to, it'll have a social order, but people aren't going to go die for each other. They're not going to make sacrifices if, um, if there isn't that group feeling. So there's that, that element there is why I think there can't really be a typical that, I, conservative today can't read that and think, oh, the answer is just to bring back religious traditions. Right. That's that's the issue with a lot of their a lot of conservatives today do see a lot of the problems, but they think that they can resolve them in these very idealist terms by bringing back culture. And even if. Even if you take Ibn Khaldun, he, he would not support that point, it would be very much social relations that would constitute that. And uh, obviously he's, he's more of a cynical type of thinker in a certain way in that he thinks this is kind of inevitable cycle of sorts uh, as far as he can tell and, and what he's analyzing and history he's working with. Um, he's not like Marx and saying we need to build communist social relations and to overcome alienation and all of that. But still, I think that's a, a crucial distinction that that religion question, even that I think Marxist overlook right because uh, i think you're absolutely correct and that's an, a very important insight into uh, ibn khaldun's deep insights on this which is that he definitely is a materialist thinker it's just it's not our kind of materialist thinker because he still believes in religion so when you know when he's you know he still believes in the theological and the cosmological he just sort of brackets it however and says yeah, but it's not going to have social reality unless it makes use of asabia. Like it has to fit into the social theory. As you're saying, it doesn't spread without asabia. Now, it may help create asabia, but you have to have asabia and social structures in order for it to have, you know, for, and this, of course, his big example here, uh, you know, one might, yeah, his big example here, of course, is Islam that spreads, um, you know, we don't mean that. Muslims uh, spread by conquest. I mean, uh, Muslim power spreads by conquest. Um, it takes a long time for people to actually convert to Islam in, in you know, the areas that the early Arab Muslims conquer. Like, you know, it, it's uh, 300 years, uh, maybe even longer for a place like Egypt. Some people think that Egypt didn't become majority Muslim, uh, particularly in the countryside and the Nile Delta and places like this until you know, maybe the 13th century. So we're talking about five, six centuries, you know, before that social transformation takes place. But his point is, is that this process cannot happen without, you know, uh, 
the social relations to spread this message, to make it powerful, to conquer these lands, uh, and so on. It doesn't just come uh, because it's a good idea, you know, uh, that it that it spreads. And so I think that's a very important uh, sort of point about the materialism of how he sees even cultural phenomenon. Like cultural phenomenon don't just uh, uh, have force in the world without making use of uh, asabia, which is fundamentally a social relation. Um, so in that way, he is a very, you know, uh, left thinker. I mean, I don't know if what his like real commitments would be, but in terms of Actually, what I think, you know, I mean, he's not a Hegelian, you know, I guess in a, in a strict way. He doesn't think that the ideas just manifest themselves in history. What he, you know, is, con is convinced by is that the forms of social organization and what they produce in terms of uh, the strength of those social relationships is the crux of historical development and change. And without that, nothing makes sense in history. And so that's fundamentally a materialist position. I think Hegel is a materialist, but that's another different oh, okay. Good. question. Because well, well. <laughs> there's, there's a certain, like, of course, uh, Zizekian type of reading of, of, of Hegel that, and uh, that's a whole other a whole other can of worms. Well, you have but, to have somebody on on a different show, and then I can yeah. educate myself by listening. I had school. one, but we didn't cover that as much. But I do have an episode on Hegel. Uh, it's tough stuff. Like I, I won't claim like I'm. I'm still working through it. I wouldn't be the the one. I like to take refuge as a historian. <laughs> We're not expected to like actually have ideas. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so w one thing that I feel like Marxists could learn from this is that mm -hmm. when we think of what drives history forward there's we think class conflict but we forget what facilitates class consciousness or consciousness and i think this brackets out a more simple fact of human history and human sociability and that is just group consciousness regardless of class will get to class but when it comes to what actually gets people to do irrational things individually that are rational for the group making sacrifices that get people to collectively triumph and not many marxists deal with with that which as a result i actually think this is this is I mean, controversial to say maybe but i think um marx is kind of in the lack of understanding these more dare what i say primordial human tendencies that still exist that are just part of us throughout history left a vacuum for fascism to capitalize on things like mythical thinking and um and and, and appeals to these more primitive instincts and what i uh would say though is that there are marxists who have written about this it's not many and one of them who uh i have read is is regis debray if you're familiar with him, he was uh yeah the uh, Regis Debray, the sixties uh, situationists. Uh, he situationist. changed. He was kind of all over the place. Like he uh, met with Che Guevara. He was like a Marxist huh. Leninist for quite a while. Uh, not yeah. really, not really situationist as far as I'm aware of. Okay, uh, yeah. he did have a reformist turn because he tried to first work with Allende, uh, right. and uh, then he worked with Mitterrand. He tried to work with Mitterrand. Okay, in, but in, he was like that. He was. He was important in like the Paris 68 and he was a thinker that came out of that, right? Is, is he, was that correct? he was kind of like, I think he's a dark horse in French theory because he was never really popular. Mm. He's, he's one of those people that is just doesn't, isn't read that much, but he has critique of political reason, which uh, I've only started. But it, the, how I found it was I was trying to look at just people who try to understand human history in, um, a materialist way while analyzing this problem, which is that how do you actually get groups to mobilize? And I, I always felt, felt that was kind of lacking in Marxism. Mm -hmm. uh, and fa fascists make, made the point, which is kind of, I think, irrefutable if, when it comes to historical evidence, which is that national consciousness just works, whereas class consciousness is very, it, it doesn't really mobilize the same way. And we see that with 
the fact that most communist revolutions came out of national liberation and that even communist revolutions like the Bolshevik, Bolshevik October eventually took on nationalistic elements with Stalin and finding ways to mobilize people for the war effort. And uh, I think this is something we have to we have to kind of deal with because people read Marx and they say religion's the opium of the people and they forget why he said it was the opium yeah. of the people and that they need it as long as there's alienation and suffering and even Haldun makes this very realist case, even despite being a believer himself, makes a realist case. He doesn't say yes. we need Islam because it's good. We right. need, we, well, we, he says, yeah, it's the best religion, but we need, we need it because life is filled with suffering and uh, is trife and futile. That's uh, one of the quotes. Yes, yes. Right. And um, what, I, what I thought was interesting here, too, is I guess maybe going to the religious question. He has this part where he argues against what are radical reformers of his time who want to keep Islam but get rid of the caliph. The imam, the imamate. Right. Sorry, the imam, I, imam, the person who's like effectively the equivalent of like the pope. Well, and, I wouldn't say the pope, of. but like uh, the person who um, has legitimate political and religious leadership. Right, mm. yes, yeah. yeah. So yeah. he, he argues for that more or less in, in a way by saying, well, we, I, I, I don't, I will basically, for listeners' sake, because of scholarly sake, I just point you to the quote, but for listeners' sake, what he more or less argues is that, well, might is right. Even if we believe we have the truth, how are we going to make sure that is the truth proper, right? How does it triumph over all the other interpretations? And you need this sort of monopoly on official truth, like religion becomes religion as such through the state. And you know, you wanna might look at that and see, oh well, that it shouldn't be that way. But I mean, the insight here, I guess, is not only is religion part of uh, ha has a material reason for its existence. It's not just a distraction from material forces. And that what religion manifests is a creature of the state, or at least it's imposed, it has to maintain by the state in terms of interpretation. I'm curious if you'd like to get into that, because all of that is a little bit under, I think, I think these are all crucial points. The, yeah, they are. I mean, this is a, such a complex um, area, and um, I have, it's been a few years since I read the chapters on, you know, this problem of the caliphate. So I may, you know, it would be better if I had a, a you know, kind of a refresher about it. Um, but um, he sees, you know, in, in in many ways, I guess I would say that you can really characterize a lot of his thinking. And this is by no means a kind of criticism. This is a pretty deep insight, even if a lot of social scientists may take issue with it, you know, now is that he really does look at kind of social function like he which for somebody who's in a kind of uh, theological, you know, uh, era, uh, you know, of thinking or that Greek, you know, kind of philosophical orientation where it's about essences and so on. I think this is actually, you know, very important and profound in terms of being able to analyze social relations and power in society is to think about their functions. And so he does that with basically, you know, many aspects of religious uh, kind of religious ideas is that he believes in them and believes that they are legitimate. And he kind of conforms more or less to a lot of traditional kind of he has some views that I think are, are potentially quite controversial, but a lot of things he takes on board the tradition, partly uh, because he thinks that it does provide a necessary basis for social order. And in some ways, this isn't so, um, you know, in some ways, maybe this isn't so radical, because if you think about uh, prior uh, political theorists and political philosophers in the tradition, somebody like Al-Farabi, you know, um, who I'm sure Ibn Khaldun is pretty familiar with, um, you know, he argued that uh, the imam, so the same figure, 
right? That, you know, he, that this figure in Muslim traditional kind of religious ideology is the legitimate religious and political figure. And the caliph uh, is the kind of office that ends up becoming established under the victory of the Sunnis. They kind of really uh, reframe this concept of imam as, well, you just need a symbolic uh, kind of leader who's legitimate on religious terms, but they aren't themselves necessarily a you know, religious guide, which is where the difference with the Shia is, is that the Shia believe that these twin functions actually have to come together in the same person. Um, but in any case, Al-Farabi is also wrestling with this problem because this is the key problem of politics in, and political theory in, you know, Islamicate uh, civilization. Uh, and his argument is, is that the prophet, the imam, and i.e. the legislator, that is the sort of philosopher king, is somebody who is essentially has a philosophical understanding, but they have this special other gift of being able to communicate philosophical truth in imagistic forms that can persuade people to abide by you know, the laws and the decisions and adjust, or at least a, a relative, roughly uh, stable social order um, and gives them a kind of moral basis to regulate their behavior and prevent strife and, and, and chaos. And in this theory, religion is an imitation of philosophy, right? It's not philosophy, but it contains many of the insights of philosophy uh, in an imagistic sort of way. And the only way this makes really sense is for uh, thinking of this as having a social function and a social role for the proper edification of society and its proper ordering. And in many ways, you can see that Ibn Khaldun uh, takes the same kind of idea, but then elaborates these, you know, very, very specifically with uh, not just the kind of bland overall idea that you need to have religion, you know, for social order, but actually to talk about how it, you know, preserves asabiya or how it kind of like a religious reformist movement can come along and revive and strengthen asabiya to achieve new kind of social and political purposes and so he's kind of really uh it seems to me uh uh thinking of religion he not in a i mean in a way that maybe you know certain kinds of pious believers might consider blasphemous but yet I think he's able to compartmentalize in some ways the function from the essence. And he's interested in really studying the functions because that's what makes it material in society in exactly the way that, you know, the religion wouldn't have spread without the asabiya. So that's what he thinks is really in this worldly existence. That's what you have to explain and understand. Yeah. And what I think people would find controversial, but it's not necessarily controversial, but I think uh, people who might be of an anarchist sort would, would definitely, I think in many ways, Ibn Khaldun's theory of history if we, or, and of groups and states is kind of like the almost opposite of anarchists in a certain sense that, um, well, like he doesn't, but it's interesting, unlike Hobbes, he, Ibn Khaldun doesn't seem to ever really suggest that human nature is is always uh people are naturally super high every uh, group is naturally hierarchical but the ones who build civilization are and that he says on numerous occasions that the destiny the goal of uh, group feeling of asabiya is royal authority the imposition of a state and of a hierarchy and uh regarding that thing we were talking about when it comes to religion and the imam so it's the part where he's, and this is in chapter three, when he's uh, addressing the people who are arguing that the imam is, was not needed, because of course they're, they have pretty lively debates about philosophy right. and religion during this time. It's not like you can't talk about anything. It's not like medieval Europe. Uh, so he addresses them and he says, you agree that the obs um, observance of a religious law is a necessary thing. Now that is achieved only by group feeling and power. And group feeling, by its very nature, requires royal authority. In other words, state legitimacy. State right. For, and that's a pretty uh, realist observation. Um, because, and there's there's also this other part. I I um, 
you can't find it right now, but where he, he cites the Quran to make the argument, which I think is brilliant because it's a double, it's a, it's a clever use where he cites uh, a Muhammad saying that sometimes people have to be forced to see the truth, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is very we clever know. what he was doing there. Yeah. <laughs> they have to be forced to be free. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a very good point because um, uh, the necessity, yes, uh, of, of, you know, royal authority and protecting religion. In some ways, I think what he's doing is he's building off of, of this secular kind of idea of the circle of equity or the circle of justice, uh, which he quotes, I think, I can't remember where, but early on. Um, oh, in fact, actually, he talks about political wisdom and that he quotes a kind of, um, you know, uh, eight sentences that are about how, you know, royal power, the world is a garden and it has these walls and, you know, the, you know, king is in, is the one who protects the, you know, the, he's the walls for the garden and, you know, and, you know, the uh, wealth that it, it, he provides justice and conditions that allow for material prosperity because it protects the, you know, he provides justice and, and, and security. And that allows the peasants, you know, to produce, you know, under good conditions, the surplus that supports the king. Right. You know, and so it was this kind of like circle of interdependence of how um, the kind of social society works together in justifying and legitimizing the necessity of political power under monarchical or imperial sort of rule. And it's this ancient kind of Persian uh, political philosophy or political theory that gets expressed in this almost literary way, sometimes in mirrors for princes, advice for governors, this kind of body of literature um, that is about uh, how to make the sure that the sovereign is a just and wise sovereign. And the key to political wisdom is them understanding the interdependence of all of society, that their function essentially is to make the system sort of work by providing these necessary components. And I think what Ibn Khaldun is doing is he's taking, you know, this kind of older Persian uh, social functionalist kind of model of the circle of equity and justice and also using it to understand, you know, the necessity of the religious, particularly the religious office of the imamate in Muslim society. And I will say that this does go back also to theories about religion as an ideology and what its purpose and role is that also still go back to quotations that are often attributed in kind of some of the universalist literature, like At-Tabari, one of the universalist chroniclers that Ibn Khaldun uh, cites and quotes as as of the main sort of, sort of historians of the previous generation, um, cites a story about Anushirwan, one of the late, uh, later and great uh, Sasanian empires, as being giving this kind of last will and testament to his son about how to rule wisely, where he says, "Religion and the state, royal authority and religion are brothers." You know, they have to work together. Um, but, you know, the problem is, is that royal authority. So this is more from a royalist perspective. The problem is, is that political power, royal authority um, is weak. It can only control the bodies of people. In other words, through force, you can force people to do things. Um, but that's difficult. A pre-modern state had limited access to, you know, they had to be brutal, but they had real constraints on the ability to use you know, this kind of force, your military power is limited in some ways to control the society and control people. But religion, you know, really controls the minds and the hearts of the people, their spirits. And so you have to become, you can't cede religious authority to the religious specialists because they will rise up from these subterranean sources of popular power and challenge your political authority. So you have to make sure you are, you know, kind of recognized and are intervening and are significant and important as a religious authority arbiter, as well as being just holding, you know, the political power, because 
that is the foundation that you need. And so you have these kinds of ideas about social utility of cultural and religious ideas that are part of how uh, they imagined during their time society working in an, what was seen as an equitable way, right? Because even if it's not equality, it's equitable. It's a hierarchical system, but this is the exceptional hierarchy that needs to happen, i.e. this what we would call the state. And for them, it's dynastic royal power uh, in order to make the, you know, make the system and provide security and justice uh, so that the society actually works. And I think he is also playing with these ideas and doing some interesting things with them. And he does actually, some people like to maybe assume that he wasn't aware of rational authority. He was only aware, aware of traditional authority, but there's a there's a, poor, a part where he addresses different forms of authority. And he, he recognizes that you can have law based on, uh, based on, um, Rash, rational order, rational, right. but he, he thinks the royal authority is superior for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons he gives is that, and this is a very, one that really made me think, was that when you have monarchs, and I'm more or less summarizing, like par really paraphrasing here, but the monarch is an extension of the family, of the, and people yes. feel like they're part of them, that they're related. Now, you see this in Machiavelli, on the one hand, who's a Republican, but goes from supporting it, but also supports constitutional monarchy. And there's a tension in actually his two works, Discourses in Levy and mm -hmm. The Prince. And one, one insight into this, and I think it, this, you, we see how this has affected history, is so many uh, countries that transitioned to democracy kept monarchs, like uh, England, of one of the countries at the forefront of the Enlightenment, ironically, still has monarch. And Canada still has a monarch. I believe um, certain uh, Scandinavian countries still have monarchs, like Sweden, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, like, why, why exactly, right? And pe yeah. there's this double function going on. Is we, You have this traditional authority is very powerful, and I, I, I find it bewildering. A Marxist, we find it insane, but the monarch is still popular in England, still. And people are fascinated to this very day about what they're doing and people, when they feel like it's an extension of themselves, they, there's, a, there's a certain um, p connection people will have to the state that they might not otherwise have on a purely uh, rational basis. And I think the Soviets realized this because the way the Soviets built the cult of personality around Stalin, I think, was very much a, a way of legitimizing the state. And they did this after Stalin, too, with Brezhnev when he, when he went senile. And Brezhnev was no longer really making decisions and ruling. He was in his room most of the time, and he would only come for speeches. They still kept him as the public image as if he was governing because he was so popular. So I think this is something we have to grapple with because if we don't grapple with these aspects, uh, we, we shouldn't on the one hand say this is the way things are and they have to be this way. But if we don't deal with the fact that they exist, what I worry is that Marxists may create a religion that isn't aware of itself as a religion. Well, uh, that's a good insight. And I think that definitely, I mean, we have a lot of new religions in the age of secularism. I mean, that's what we've done is invented a lot of new religions to replace the, you know, theologies that have been displaced in the traditional institutions um, that, you know, gave them social reality. So I completely agree with that. And I think, uh, you know, you, one could say national. Look, Benedict Anderson, you know, had this very important book, Imagine Communities, that I'm sure you've heard of. And, you know, basically he was looking at how religious ritual structured the modern kind of way of reading the newspaper and imagining the nation. And that instead of having, you know, everybody go to church and pray at the same time, they're doing the same kind of secular rituals uh, with the new kind of religious culture that had, had replaced it and replaced it. And we could say that about quite a number of things. And of course, Marxism. Well, look, Western religions, um, you know, if you look at Judaism, Christianity and Islam, they are so much about the problem of history. You know, they are explanations of history. Now, it's a salvation history. It's a theologized history. But there is some sense of like, you know, we're dealing here with the material, what, you know, with the conditions of this worldly life and reality 
and how it begins and how it ends. Like these are very important, you know, and that's history is how you get from beginnings to ends and how you imagine the end is very important, you know, for what you're going to do in the kind of stage of history you see yourself in. It's why apocalyptic thinkers never, you know, are talking about if there's a seven stage towards the, you know, fulfillment of these prophecies in the apocalypse. Nobody says, guess what? We're only in stage two or stage three. They always say, well, we're in stage six. We're very close to the cusp of all of these. You know, it's this kind of sense of progress in history and its culmination. And, you know, what is Marxism but another way of trying to understand the salvation of human beings in history? It's just a secular one that suggests that the forces are not God. They're these other forces, right, that do have a, you know, can you start in this progressive way? And there is supposed to be this culmination. So I do think that some people can be trapped into a non, you know, dialectical materialist and historically materialist way of reading Marx and Marxism, um, which is, I think, the problem that that's why historical consciousness is so important, historicism, because, uh, and I think that's the same with Ibn Khaldun, is that he has these amazing ideas that do um, contribute, I think, to real social analysis. And I would say one of the contributions that you were really kind of discussing and alluding to is the way in which he is cognizant of kind of cultural conditions and how they play in other material and social uh, considerations. It doesn't just privilege one mode of analysis. And it's the way in which Asabia is at once a social relationship, but it's also sentiments. It's you know, it's rooted in some kind of sense of feeling and imagination of closeness and connection that isn't just completely imagined with no basis in reality, but it is a, it is a kind of imagined, you know, kind of sensibility. Um, so he's, I think, very subtle, uh, you know, on this, and he provides some help and analysis. But at the same time, he really is a product of his period and some of the limitations of his work um, even though they may read as modern, you have to also see and take allowances for what are some of the constraints and some of the conditions that he's dealing with, that he's responding to. My favorite example of this, for example, uh, is a story that he tells early on when he's talking about why historians can get things wrong. And he gives a bunch of ways in which they can make errors for various reasons, one of which, rather interestingly, is he says that people on the basis of other, uh, on, uh, uh, you know, reflecting and adhering to authority, don't use their own critical analyses based on a sense of the actual social conditions of civilization to analyze the substance of a historical report or story or narration, and they just trust on the authority. And this means that they will convey and retell absurd stories. And he's, what he's doing is he's also talking about this is what I think is one of the controversial things in terms of religion and religious methodology is because, of course, in Sunni Islam, in, even in, in, in Shia Islam as well, you know, the hadith, the stories of what the prophet said or did are a basis for moral edification, but also Islamic law. And there was a whole kind of scholastic uh, sets of controversies and disciplines that developed in order to ensure the authenticity of you know, this corpus of materials that is a kind of historically relayed. First, it was orally, and then it started getting written down in these collections. But how did you decide which were true and which weren't, which were true reports and which were fictive and might have been fabricated or forged later on? And what he argues against what had become the prevailing consensus is that even if you think that it doesn't make sense, if the tradition of its transmission is sound, like all the oral transmitters are pious people. We have all the information about them. We don't think that they were liars. They did live at the right times to have been able to meet one another and hear these traditions from one another, et cetera. If all of that works out, you should accept it uh, as like a true report. And what he's arguing is on the basis of authority, you should still be able to invalidate some reports just because they don't coordinate with actual material conditions. And so this is seen as him being extremely critical. 
But the example that he gives to illustrate this is that historians have told this ridiculous story about Alexander when he was trying to build the famous city of Alexandria, that there were, uh, and it's on the coast, that there were all of these sea monsters that were terrorizing and harassing and preventing the building of the city. And so Alexander had a box created with a glass, a wooden crate with a glass you know, box in between, had it with air inside, had it uh, sealed up, and then was lowered into the depths of the sea so that he could see these terrible sea creatures and sea monsters, which he drew pictures of. And then when he was pulled up, he created these large kind of effigies and statues of them on the shoreline so that later when these sea monsters came up to attack the city, they saw these effigies, were frightened and ran away. And so this is a story about legendary founding of Alexandria. And Ibn Khaldun says, this is obviously a ridiculous story. And he gives you three reasons for it. One is no king would put himself in a risky situation like that uh, because he would lose legitimacy immediately and his followers wouldn't wait at any, for you know any time for him to even get back before they would revolt and say, this guy is totally unreliable and we need a better, you know, better king. Okay, fascinating kind of suggestion there. Secondly, is that there wouldn't be enough air in there and so you would you know, not be able to you know, breathe properly. This makes no sense. No one would survive this, their level of technology. He just couldn't imagine that you know, some kind of submarine type thing could really be built. And then thirdly, he says, and we all know the jinns don't take on material forms and all these stories about jinns, you know, which are these mythical, magical creatures, the genies, all the stories about them having multiple heads and things like that aren't supposed to be taken literally. We know that they can't take on these different forms. So you have in a nutshell, and extremely rational, at the same time, simultaneously, you have critical analysis, social conditions, political analysis, as well as still relying on some kind of mythic, uh, kind of religious, um, you know, the world of the unseen, you know, the jinns and, and so on, still inhabiting somehow his imagination. And so I think you can take out his insights but you also should, you know, at the same time, understand him in his kind of environment that there are going to be certain kinds of limits and constraints or that the furniture of the reality that he's describing is both historically very different, technologically very different, socially very different, but also imaginatively rather different. And all of these do pose kind of complexities um, which isn't to say that he isn't useful for Marxists. We have a lot that we can learn from him. But at the same time, I think he's a very fascinating figure because he can hold multiple, you know, kinds of um, uh, seemingly uh, absurd sort of ideas with things that strike us as deeply full of sense and reasonable an analysis while at the same time be, you know, um, kind of a product of, of, of his time. So... Uh, that was a very long excursus uh, yeah. about, but I think it gives a little flavor of what's so fascinating about somebody like Ibn Khaldun uh, and why history and understanding things in their historical context is very necessary and valuable in order to demystify, you know, certain ways in which we might inherit uh, kinds of ideas and, you know, practices and so on without knowingly and see them as the same you know, in, from one time period or another, um, but miss, uh, you know, what has to change, you know, if you're to use Ibn Khaldun's ideas, just as if we are to use Marx's ideas, you know, he is a product of his time as well, and he'll have some deep insights that are so relevant to us today, but there are also other conditions that have to be, you know, critiqued and updated, is I guess what I'm trying to say, is just as Marx, so Ibn Khaldun, these are historical great thinkers who are people whose ideas also have to be, you know, seen as products of their, of their time, even if we can learn something very important from them. Mm -hmm. You're almost segueing me to you, you what we uh, we're going to discuss after, which is interpretations regarding Ibn Khaldun. But uh, I don't want to skip over a crucial thing that I know is worth addressing, which is the question on class. Um, because 
Uh, we'll, we'll get into the interpretation about the contradictions and interpretations re regarding Gibbon Khaldun, because that is a, a definitely more scholarly question, but I think it's a highly relevant one, which we're, we're both very curious about. But what is a huge misconception I, I would like us to discuss is usually when people read about Ibn Khaldun's theory of the rise and decline of civilizations, they, they think what happens is Asabiya declines because as people live in cities, they get wealthier, they get more comfortable as they get older and generations uh, progress, people become more detached from their ancestors and the founder, the founding uh, groups who, who were able to really make the civilization happen. And uh, so there, that on the surface is true. But what is often missed is people will take that reading, the very simple reading of it, and copy and paste it to say, well, the people are declining because uh, they're too wealthy. But what they, is always bracketed out, which is always missed by most analyses or most readings of Ibn Khaldun, I notice, is class conflict. And if, and if we are to say, well, maybe he just wasn't aware, he wasn't a very class conscious individual, I would argue the contrary. Because, mm. I mean, chapter four, which, uh, as you alluded to, he talks about the labor theory of uh, like a, a theory of value, what is what it creates all value and says labor <laughs> creates value. And yeah, he has a whole analysis there that's just oh, very overt in terms of talking about class uh, in, in uh, the chapter four, which is the economic analysis, really the economic part of the uh, Mukadima. But in there, he, he even says that uh, people with property need protection from the state, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is pretty like, I mean, it's pretty Marxist insight, isn't it? And as I think in chapter three, there's the most direct quote, which I think is clear that the decline of Asabi is inseparably related to class. And it is where, where he says, well, why does uh, Asabi decline? It doesn't just decline over time. That is true. It is a generational thing. But it, he says it declines almost immediately upon royal authority. And um, there's a part where he says during, well, during the imposition of royal authority, Asab Asabiya begins to decline. And this is because the ruler, quote, gains complete control over his people, claims royal authority all for himself, excluding them and prevents them from trying to have a share in it. Yes. He says different versions of the same thing in longer uh, ways. But the crux is, is that, well, people, when they're first, they're, they have this group solidarity, they all feel like they have something to gain and they have very little to, to lose. And what happens when you have a, a well, what we would call a state, mm -hmm. you have a state hierarchy and those people can expropriate the uh, wealth and labor more and you get a inequality. And then, so when he says that as civilizations get wealthy and there's more leisure, I mean, is he talking about everybody or his classes? Because, I mean, w one, if you, I, I'd be curious uh, as to what other evidence you could speak to this class Marxist reading of Ibn Khaldun. And two, why is that not more common? Because the, that just really surprised me. To me, it's pretty, uh, it wasn't even that subtle. Or it might have been it might have been subtle in the sense that he doesn't call out any like particular rulers or particular classes, but it's very obvious that as to what he's saying with regard to uh, Asabiya and inequality. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think uh, part of it has to do with the fact that um, he's not talking about the way well, he's, he, he's not offering a class analysis that is the way, you know, we would analyze, say, the urban culture and civilization when he's uh, providing this diagnosis of how wealth, luxury and ease, you know, ends up corrupting. Uh, uh, Asabia, um, he is talking about what you just mentioned is among the ruling military class and military uh, strata, um, a, a kind of social division that emerges through uh, the establishment of royal dynastic power and authority that separates uh, the sovereign from his military, from which was, of course, a household, a kind of like, you know, cadres of tribal forces of, you know, households, clans and so on that saw themselves as affiliated and attached and that the conditions of life and of rulership 
in the urban settled civilization uh, produces material conditions that separate, uh, you know, the sovereign from uh, that ruling military group, or at least the group that brought him, you know, uh, into power um, and galvanized a sense of group solidarity. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why is because we're talking about a particular, we're talking about uh, kind of power and social status and a kind of class analysis within the ruling uh, kind of strata. So it's an insight uh, that results from the historic conditions, you would have to say, of medieval Muslim political, uh, medieval Muslim polities, where, um, you know, the establishment of a kind of uh, bureaucratic state means uh, the taking away of like the, the, the uh, kind of political power of the military uh, uh, commanders and creating a state puts distance. And you see this even in the advice manuals of other uh, mirrors for princes, uh, for sovereigns, is they talk about how, um, you know, these nomadic tribal warriors in the case, for example, of the Seljuks, but you could easily see this happening in the case of Berber tribal you know, groups that come to power in North African polities uh, like the Hafsid state or, you know, uh, uh, the Marinids in Morocco and so on, is that, um, is that y y you can have your commanders and your, um, and, uh, and your boon companions, but you need to separate that world out from the actual functions of governance. And of course, these advice manuals are all written by in the East Persian bureaucrats and in the in the West, mostly in the Muslim West, mostly by people like Ibn Khaldun, except that he seems to disagree, you know, with a lot of his sort of cadre of, of administrators and and theoreticians and um, is that you're supposed to keep these things separate. And you should turn over things, you know, the running of the state to the professionals, the bureau, you know, basically the PMC of the time, the professional managerial class. They run the state. And, you know, you can still entertain your close relations with the people who brought you there, uh, but you're not going to let them make any real decisions, you know, on, you know, distribution of wealth and and governmental power or administration of justice or any of these key key things. So the the origins of the state for Ibn Khaldun come out of this sort of tribal dynastic households, uh, but then they are transformed into bureaucratic power that doesn't have the same ability to maintain those bonds of affiliation because now you're dealing with a more impersonalized kind of structure for uh, governance according to certain norms and practices of administrative, you know, rules and how the chancery is supposed to work and so on, this kind of specialized knowledge that's created um, that is divorced from the social conditions under which power had actually been created, uh, you know, and established the, the, the dynastic state. So I think that's part of the, the, the peculiarities of that condition mean that that analysis that he has, which could be generalized in other conditions, is seen as relevant to the particularities of the medieval Muslim state and the way in which there was nomadic or tribal power uh, that was separated from this attempt to make an, uh, you know, a more bureaucratic state in urban culture and civilization. And most of these people, this is the important point, is that most of these kind of new conquerors come into, uh, you know, the, the cities and they conquer them. But then, you know, there's already a pre-existing class of scribes, administrators, uh, accountants, you know, bureaucrats, basically, who are controlling the machinery of the state, which at this point in history is more developed than, say, in medieval Europe. Of course, it's not a modern state, but there is a chancery and their record keeping and, you know, pretty sophisticated accounting and, and so on. Um, and so these are the emblems of power and legitimate rulership in this society is being able to use those emblems of power, but doing so uh, kind of creates a kind of power differential or a social division uh, that you could describe as a class kind of uh, separation. You have the birth here of a, 
uh, a, a fragmentation within a ruling military political class. Um, so because it's not being extended maybe to the analysis of um, the civilian population, you know, when he's talking about the crafts and the organization of crafts and, um, and so on in society and that kind of social interdependence at the economic level and the division of labor within urban, medieval Muslim urban culture and civilization, I think conventional left Marxist type thinking doesn't necessarily translate those insights that he has about the dynamics of power among the ruling elite uh, to what we think of as social class on a broad social scale. Yeah, that's a very useful context. Like, uh, definitely, thanks for adding that. I think, um, yeah, most Marxists were, think, were used to thinking of the dominant and dominated classes, but if one looks at um, more sophisticated Marxists like uh, Gramsci and especially uh, Nikos Polansis, someone who, who, who I'm a big reader of, is he looks a lot of interdivisions between the ruling class. And I mean, he fills a void that I think um, Marx, Mar uh, Marxists had before. Kind of, well, Marx himself wrote about divisions within the ruling class, too, in 18th Brumaire. Just yeah, I was going to say before yeah. when you said that, like, you know, there's a gap or really kind of considering how some of this right wing fascism can emerge from these revolutionary conditions and so on. Um, I thought a little bit about the 18th Brumaire uh, as clearly a case where he's having to wrestle with, um, you know, counter revolutionary, uh, you know, uh, popular counter revolutionary mm. uh, governance and the myth making there. Um, but, you know, that's a weird work because he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't theorize from it so much as have insights and mm. and kind of barbed kind of, you know, pers he has these nuggets of, of perspective and interpretations, but he doesn't theorize it the way he does in other of his, of his works. So I wonder exactly. if that, that still is a problem that, um, you know, the question is, you know, what's his gen genuine explanation, you know, on a more abstracted level mm -hmm. of the of that process? Um, it seems like that one's very suffused in just the particular historical situation. And he doesn't really have a fully worked out theory of why that revolutionary class moment can go, you know, become retrograde <laughs> and you can have these counter revolutionary and fascistic tendencies. Yeah. Right. And that's uh, because Marx was ultimately just r really analyzing things as they were happening. So there's only so much he could have yeah. really put together. And that's why uh, Nikos Palantzis, he makes the claim that there isn't a Marxist theory of the state uh, concretized in the Marxist works, but they're all the elements uh, for forming one, which he does, are there already. They just, there's nuggets there that need to be parceled together. And um, he says the person who was closest to doing this before, because uh, it was Marx, Engels, Lenin does it. But Lenin's theory is not very, it's very kind of a little one-dimensional, like the bourgeoisie rules the state. He doesn't think about how capitalism can persist without the bourgeoisie ruling or even uh, with a completely different class ruling. And he says Gramsci adds to that. It's kind of a little bit how, well, Freud is someone who people shouldn't just read and think he figured it all out. He was constantly changing his theories and you had people come after him who were adding a lot of things and changing a lot of things like Lacan and uh, Melanie Klein, of course. So we're treated Marxism like a science. It's this evolving process. Um, the uh, part back to the part about the context of Ibn Khaldun's uh, the class struggles, if you will. Um, Lacoste talks about that a lot in the book about the military aristocracy and uh, kind of how the closest thing in we might call it that was similar to was like what Marx called the Asiatic mode of production. But that would, of course, was a big generalization that has it, tons of flaws in it. But it is it's it's so radically different from uh, bourgeois class relations, even though there is like proto capitalist relations in a certain sense in terms of market society uh, in uh, the times in which he's writing. And uh, I think you see elements of the class analysis of those relations as well with the part about people owning property needing protection because mm -hmm. inevitably as you have property differences you'll have um resentments boil there's that's a part in the uh, economics chapter so he's clearly 
uh, aware of of that. So I can see that there's, on the one hand, this inter-class division uh, within the ruling class as to how you have Asabia decline. And I think that's probably related as to why he thinks a symptom of decline of civilizations is when when um, civilizations start outsourcing their military power to people outside of the groups, right? Like uh, mercenaries outside. And we see, I think that's relevant to this very day. I mean, you look at Russia. Russia, right? Russia yeah. relies increasingly on private military contracts, even the U.S. to a certain extent. But um, Russia... Oh, to a great extent, uh, increasingly, like ever since... Uh... The global war on terror, I think, mm. you know, um, especially post Iraq, right? There were so many of these military contractors and so on. And that's in, an increasing uh, process. It looks like it's, it's a process. I mean, if there's one place where the, you know, uh, welfare state uh, has managed to preserve itself the longest in, you know, the Western industrialized democracies, it is in the military. But yet that process, it just shows how, um, you know, the dismantling of the welfare state is, you know, is, 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 has happened, you know, in other sectors of, of the state and society. It's finally coming to the military where the last like 15, 20 years, there's been the acceleration of privatizing like a lot of military functions and so on. Um, but that's just an index of, uh, 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 of, that, of that process. And of course, that is coincident, you know, with what we could say is, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of talk now because of multipolarity and so on. And the fact that the United States is, is um, clearly not as geopolitically influential as it once was, that there's a lot of talk about the demise of the American empire and so on as something that's happening now and, and, and so on. But I actually think you have to go back to that 2003 I think the Iraq war was exactly the moment when you could talk about, um, you know, the beginning of, of, of a real precipitous uh, end and the, um, you know, transition to uh, a more unstable future, you know, starting then, you know, when it l appeared to many that it was like the height of U.S. Uh, kind of global domination. But I, I think it was actually sort of the reverse. And we've only seen, as you were saying, like the use of mercenaries and proxies and so on uh, since that point has accelerated. I mean, with the U.S. withdrawing from Afghanistan, the fact that it doesn't want to commit, you know, um, troops in, in, in any real theater, if it can possibly help it and find others to, to do it. Um, I mean, you could say in some ways that they've tried to make Ukraine mercenaries for their anti-Russia you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 policies as, as well. So, uh, well, that, that is actually an example of a group that has pretty strong Asabia is the Ukraine. Yeah. It is everyone expected Russia to pretty much roll over Ukraine. I mean, and that's why it seemed so ir extremely irresponsible to back the Ukrainians because it was just such a, I th it's still probably an impossible. It is kind of an impossible. I would say, a uh, project for the U Ukraine to really defeat Russia in this war. But it's still, I mean, the fact that they've done so well is a testament to the fact of strong solidarity because I think Putin underestimated that. Putin thought that uh, you, because of the cultural similarities and shared history of Ukrainians and Russians that um, Ukraine wouldn't be able to mobilize as well. But, I mean, they have. So pretty... Yeah, that that's... <clears throat> Certainly true. He, like Timur, uh, probably should have consulted Ibn Khaldun on some of these kinds of questions because uh, if he had been able to have uh, an accurate representation of that sense of group feeling, um, particularly of Western Ukrainians, but even, you know, uh, increasingly as a result of the invasion, central Ukrainians, it has, you know, um, kind of produced. Uh, a much more, uh, you know, violent and vicious and extended, you know, horrible war where so many thousands of people have have died uh, as a consequence. And it actually, a, a friend of mine, you know, um, 
we were discussing Palestine, Israel as well. And uh, he was like bemused and almost in some sense sort of distraught by the idea that um, the Palestinians were so different in some ways from other conquered peoples, peoples who had lost wars, that they continued to resist, even though it might mean, it seemed from his perspective, uh, the continuation of uh, their misery and suffering um, that they're holding on to um, that attachment to their homeland, uh, to resist dispossession, to resist uh, kind of resettlement in some way. Of course, many people leave. Individuals have to escape when they can and take opportunities to leave. But as a people, there is some kind of deep commit and continuing commitment to maintaining their national identity and national rights uh, to Palestine, even though it means that they are subjected to so much violence. Of course, we're seeing, you know, it now. Um, and, you know, he was saying, why don't they just like not, you know, I mean, just move on and be like, like all these other historically defeated peoples and try and find a new kind of mode of existence, uh, you know, uh, it would be, um, you know, far less violent, you know, that the, and so I felt like this is, of course, to my mind, blaming the victim, you know, I mean, this is the era of international law. Um, they have a right to their struggle and they have a right to their homeland. The problem is, is that, um, you know, U.S., U.K., uh, Western governments are uh, unwilling to, um, you know, intervene and because they, they prop up, um, the state of Israel and support it and, and granted impunity, of course. Yeah. We have a cycle that seems insoluble and it is just devastating and tragic for all the participants. So, you know, Asabia, you know, is a motive and an engine of history as we understand and learn from, from Ibn Khaldun, but it is potentially also a pathology of you know, historical, you know, suffering. I mean, the group identities to which you are attached are now serious commitments that sometimes, you know, if you have strong asabia, you have, you know, now, um, you know, those responsibilities in history that you are attached to this, this kind of group, you know, group commitment. Um, and so I think that's maybe the other side of it all is the cautionary element of group identity and group feeling as a social basis um, for explaining uh, uh, in a materialist way, um, change in history um, is uh, that it's not just a progressive force, of course, um, for development, which um, in some ways you could say that people who look at uh, Ibn Khaldun's dynastic cyclical theory uh, mm. would regard it as obviously not progressive because it's just this cycle of you know, it has progressive elements and periods, but then it is a natural and inevitable uh, uh, falling into uh, decline and, um, you know, weakness and so on that then creates a cycle of creation and destruction, as it were, and that that's not, um, you know, kind of a, you know, that's almost ahistorical in a way by finding this pattern, you know, is like, well, um, by finding this kind of pattern in, in dynastic history, principally in North African history, which is the evidentiary basis upon and the context in which he's working and what he's most familiar with and attempting to explain most closely at hand, is that um, in some ways it's about how there isn't change in history. There's only a certain kinds of changes that repeat. Mm -hmm. But I think he's actually more complex than that, which is why he's able to talk about these kind of historic um, uh, dispensations and dynastic uh, civilizations um, of different nations and peoples uh, in history um, because he's also capable and I think very attuned to and interested in a kind of history and theory of knowledge and of, you know, kind of craft development and other sorts of technical and uh, scholarly um, you know, advancement and improvement, um, you know, I think particularly in kind of craft techniques and, and, and also the development of urban civilization. So I don't think he should be looked at as just sort of uh, kind of understanding history in this atavistic kind of cycle of, you know, creation and destruction. But mm. um, that is one 
kind of issue or problem uh, that his analysis might pose for people um, who don't want to only look at a kind of structure, uh, but also want to see history as unfolding mm-hmm. in an eventful, temporal, uh, uh, temporally unique, uh, y- unique fashion. Mm-hmm. And he is also, to be fair, working with um, non Middle East. He's, he's also working with other civilizations beyond what he's immediately studying because he has Rome to work with. He has uh, ancient Greece. He, had, he has various uh, Persians. There's a lot of other examples that he's aware of, right? And, uh, yeah. but that sort of history happening this over and over and over again, I guess people get that interpretation because he's often compared with Thucydides, right? Mm -hmm, Who uh, mm -hmm. has that sort of view. And it's easy to draw that parallel. And I do think there is that in Ibn Khaldun, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's always going to occur the same way. But I think in Ibn Khaldun, there is a difference in that from like a Hegel and a Marx, and that in Hegel and a Marx, there is this teleological project that it's heading to something. Whereas I think, Ibn Haldun is more like for Ibn Haldun there there's he's more like Weber than Marx. This is what I would say is because right. Weber f- uh, likes to separate the is and the ought, the real and the ideal, except they only look at the real and they're very, uh, as a result, realist and materialist. But um, they, whereas they try to detach themselves from a kind of ideal with Marx, the attachment of the the ideal is always there, right? And it's part of it's baked into his theory of history. Um, but then again, um, re- interpretations uh, regarding Ibn Khaldun can be multifaceted. One thing that I come away from is where while li- where liberals are often uh, like to say individuals, great individuals make history. The Marxist retort, or maybe more broadly, communist retort to that, is often the masses make history. What I always, what I find from Ibn Khaldun is, for for to take history <laughs> with all the baggage that entails, but the groups make history. Groups make history. That's what I get from his analysis, and I find that to be a, it is a, it is a compelling way to look at things. I mean, you could say it's context specific, but you can also interpret other elements of history far after Ibn Khaldun in that way. If one interprets, um. The Russian Revolution as a result of the masses or as a result of a party capitalizing on the masses. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. someone like Pareto will see things in terms of actually it's a small percentage of Wilfredo Pareto who I have to con- like sometimes I like to learn from the enemy theorists, the enemy camp often that sometimes uh, they have a point every now and then. And one of that is that sort of elite theory that a small percentage of people make history. Um, he views it in a more hierarchical way, but I think in terms of if you look at some groups will just triumph over other groups if we look at the Russian Revolution that way, and that it was ultimately the Bolsheviks who were able to capitalize on anti-war sentiments of the Russian Revolution. They were able to make communism. Communism was not inevitable in, whatsoever in Russia, right? Um, but this group was able to make this happen within these conditions that enabled it, but the conditions didn't determine it. Right, right. right. The conditions enabled it, but they also had to have some strong asabiya to uh, mm-hmm. prevail under the competitive conditions of the late Tsarist state, you know? Yeah. So I think that's a nice way of saying that. Um, I think you're right that maybe you could see Ibn Khaldun as... Um, uh, pretty close in some respects to Weber uh, in that he is trying to integrate some of what we would think of as cultural forms. And, you know, even this idea, you know, it struck me when I first read Ibn Khaldun that he was trying to provide maybe a slightly more materialist basis and social basis for what Weber talks about as charismatic authority, which I feel like is a pretty un- uh, you know, digested notion that he uses, you know, sort of at the limit, you know, let me create this category of where I can't really explain in social terms. So I will you know, just talk about like the participants recognizing charisma, you know, and that that creates a sort of willingness to, to lead, you know, follow somebody and, and so on. 
I feel like, you know, maybe even Khaldun actually has uh, a theory of charismatic authority uh, when he's talking about royal, you know, power uh, that is more rooted in the social relations between people and how to understand and uh, uh, understand that uh, bond and what um, enhances it and what detracts from it in terms of the conditions around it. Uh, than maybe you know Weber uh, Weber did, but that they they are working on a kind of problem there about the c- cultural components and the social components under which uh, uh, you know power is is developed and uh, power and authority are 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 understood. So we're um, we've discussed a lot, and I know we we did want to discuss interpretations regarding Ibn Khaldun specifically to the what extent his uh, time period may have affected uh, the way in which he presents some of his ideas, which are not always obvious. Um, I think the big contradiction in his ideas isn't actually so much the class aspect, but it's the materialist aspect, because there's so much evidence also one can point to that he is a Platonist uh, and an idealist, but uh, that people will often point to as contradictions like Robert Irwin, but um, we'll discuss that in the uh, second half, which will be a much shorter uh, part of the podcast. You can find it on uh, Patreon. And um, if you found this episode great, I highly encourage you to give it a five-star rating and check out Guerrilla History if you don't know it already. Fantastic. And um, yeah, see you there. And see you in the Backroom Podcast. My only hope is that when enough people become pessimist, then out of despair, somebody maybe does something. But you know why I also like to be a pessimist? Because it's the only way to have a nice life. If you're an optimist, then always bad things happen and you are always uh, disappointed. When you are a pessimist, then you look around, okay, there are bad, but from time to time something nice happens and you are, as a pessimist, you are a little bit glad all the time, no? You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content.